Cornwall, land of blue skies and beaches, holiday homes, bird watchers and biking expeditions, a picturesque corner of Britain, and a part of England for over a thousand years. Yet, underneath the surface, a different culture still clings on here. A different language, traditions and folklore. Testament to the Celtic rulers who once held sway. For in reality, this rugged land has more in common with Brittany and Wales than it does England. For the Cornish, the open sea flanking to north and south has always been a highway, not a barrier. It's the same today, just as it was in ancient times. The landscape here is starkly beautiful. Peaceful coves, rolling hills and wild moors. Amidst ancient hedgerows and field boundaries, some of them dating back thousands upon thousands of years to the Bronze Age and earlier. Unusual vegetation holds sway too. Vegetation that grows nowhere else on the island as a result of the warm weather of the Gulf Stream. Yet, such is the remoteness of the place. The rocky ground unsuited for industrial-scale agriculture. Few large modern settlements grew up here, leaving castles, ancient hill forts and stone circles still standing on the landscape, unchanged for millennia. In recent years, excavations at prominent sites like Tintagel Castle, famous in Arthurian legend as the birthplace of the mythic king, revealed early medieval trade links all across Europe and beyond. For during that so-called Dark Age, following the Roman withdrawal from Britain, this place was one of the most important commercial centres in the entirety of the North Atlantic. But how far back did these international links run? In order to find out, we have to go back much further. Long before the Romans ever set foot on these islands. Three thousand years ago, Europe was a very different place, peopled by chariot-riding pagan clans, divided into distinct groups by archaeologists based on their material remains. For the most part, just like today, these were insular-looking groups of people, perhaps united by a similar culture and religious ideas. Though, unfortunately, not much more can be said concretely due to a complete lack of written sources. In Cornwall, the remains of this time can still be seen today. The famous wild horses of this region originated in that ancient time, transplanted here from the Eurasian steppe along with their breeders during the murky epoch following the Stone Age. The vast stone boundaries erected by these people, known as reeves, stretch far into the distance. Even settlements like Grimm's Pound can still be seen up on Dartmoor, along with tiny holdouts of the woodland which once coated all of Europe. Then, sometime around 1000 BC, amidst the turmoil of a new age of iron, in the aftermath of the late Bronze Age collapse, strangers arrived on British shores.
we know that ancient Brits were already taking to the sea at this time. The Dover and Ferriby boats tell us that much. Large craft designed primarily to hug shores along with genetic evidence suggesting at least some heritage from the continent. But these new ships, carrying travellers from the east, they were different. Originating in a different world, in fact. One of city builders, sea-spanning commerce, writing. For these travellers had their roots well over 3,000 miles away, in what is now Lebanon and Israel, half a world away. Besides that it happened, we know nothing of this first meeting. Was it set up by middlemen along the coast of what is now France? or instigated by explorers striking out anew. We simply can't say. Yet, the evidence of these Iron Age wanderers showing up in the archaeological record is indisputable. In fact, evidence of Semitic travellers from the Levant has also been found all along the seashores of the Mediterranean and beyond. Cutting a path all the way from the Levant to Britain. But why had they come this far north, past the Pillars of Hercules into the wild Atlantic? Well, we do know the answer to that one. The evidence for it can be found all over the peninsula. Tin. An especially rare and sought after metal. One of the main components in bronze making and a commodity that's still mined here today. Indeed, the very name of Britain itself may have derived from the one that these wanderers gave the island. Baratanak, meaning land of tin. However, if those seafarers did write histories of their voyages, none have survived to the present, all of their writing having disappeared along with the parchment it was written on. In order to explore their story, we must turn to later writers. As early as 445 BC, Herodotus speaks of the British Isles as the Tin Islands, or Cassiterides. The Greek explorer Pythias of Massalia writer of the now lost earliest account of the North Atlantic, mentioned the tin trade, as does Polybius and Diodorus of Sicily. It's even been argued that this trade existed as far back as 1500 BC. But who were those wanderers? Of course, they were the Phoenicians. some of the most successful traders in history. Often called the first true seafarers of Europe, and often credited with the first true alphabet. One which the English language is written in today. Praised by Homer and Herodotus as expert shipbuilders, in the Bible, the prophet Ezekiel refers to them as merchants to the people of many coastlines. Later, they were even commandeered by the British Empire. And all manner of other bizarre theories, such as their involvement in the building of King Solomon's temple, have linked them to nationalist movements all across the continent. 
Yet, outside of myth, their very real story, often hamstrung by a total lack of their own contemporary sources, is one of the most fascinating of any in human history. Hundreds of years before the Greeks started their great outward expansion, this was arguably the first seafaring culture to span the entirety of the Mediterranean Sea and beyond. At first, for centuries, one with no competition to speak of. But who were these Phoenicians, and how did they manage to not only sail to the ends of the earth, thousands of kilometers across the dark waters of the Mediterranean Sea, but to link up all of its shores into an interconnected web of trading centers. Long before anyone else attempted anything of the like. Well, let's find out. Hello, and welcome to History Time. As always, I'm your host, Pete Kelly. The research and initial scripting of this episode was undertaken by the great History with Sai. Go check out his channel for epic ancient history content. This video is part of a collaboration with two other excellent history channels, The Histocrat and Stefan Milo. We've all made videos related to ancient Carthage, so I highly recommend going and watching their videos after you finish this one. But first, before we embark on this hour-long voyage into the ancient history of the Mediterranean Sea, I'd like to just take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video. It's Magellan TV. Right, that's lunch. For just a small monthly fee, you can find more than 3,000 documentaries on practically any subject you can think of. History, geography, science, culture, and much, much more. All streamed directly to your phone, your tablet, and your smart TV. My personal recommendation, and a series that I've been loving recently, is The Lives of the Pharaohs a multi-part collection of documentaries looking at the fascinating ancient history of Egypt. There are also loads more documentaries on many aspects of the ancient world. Now, I've teamed up with Magellan to offer you an exclusive, month-long free trial. Head on over to try.magellantv.com forward slash history time, or click on my link in the description below. And for a limited time, Magellan are offering a buy one get one free gift card so you can share the gift of knowledge with those closest to you. Head on over to my Magellan page in the description below to take advantage of this limited offer. Now, back to the ancient world. say that the cities of southern Spain have a rich history would be an understatement. These lively port cities like Malaga, Cartagena and Cadiz, to name just a few, are where Romans, Vandals, Visigoths, Berbers, Arabs and of course Castilians all left their mark. However, what most people don't realize is that the founding of many of these cities predates all of these disparate peoples by centuries. For they are some of the oldest cities on the continent. Though a scattering of relatively large settlements did exist here in prehistory, the walled Copper Age metropolis of Los Melares tells us that much. Yet, archaeology suggests that the first true city builders in Spain seem to have arrived from elsewhere. In the early 1960s, 
Archaeologists discovered the vestiges of an ancient cemetery near the resort town of Almunacar in Spain. At first, they thought they'd excavated the remains of early Greek colonists who had set up shop in the region. However, it soon became clear that the ceramics being uncovered here were from a place even further to the east than Greece. Their design was typical of those found in the Iron Age world of the ancient Near East. Specifically, the lands known in early antiquity as Canaan. In the decades that followed, several sites with similar artefacts were discovered not only throughout Spain, but in Morocco, Malta, Sardinia, Sicily, and even, as we have seen, as far away as Britain. The archaeologists concluded that the discovery of these Near Eastern ceramics, as well as the Canaanite writing often inscribed upon them, was no fluke. But confirmation that a group of people the Greeks called Phoenicians had settled en masse throughout the Mediterranean. Certainly by the 9th and 8th centuries BC, and possibly much earlier. There is a problem, however. There is no known instance of a Phoenician ever calling themselves a Phoenician, or any other collective term for their people. In their inscriptions, a scattering of which survive, they describe themselves in terms of their individual families and cities not in terms of a common culture. The archaeology speaks of this too. The city of Byblos, for example, looked more to Egypt than its neighbours. Sidon looked to Greece and Persia, whereas Tyre held close links with Judea and Jerusalem. Yet, for the most part, besides a handful of references to a corpus of now lost books. Not only can the Phoenicians, the very people usually credited with transmitting the very first alphabet to the Greeks, no longer speak for themselves. But those who did write about them almost unanimously despised everything they were. What would we know of Greece or Rome if every history had been lost or purposely destroyed besides those written by their enemies? Their libraries burned, temples desecrated. Thus, telling the history of the Phoenicians is a detective story. Nevertheless, since the 1800s, it's been attempted, at first by French scholars such as Ernst Renan, who undertook the first wide-scale excavations in the Levant. Excavations which have continued near continuously for well over 150 years, and much has been learned in that time. The story of the Phoenicians begins much earlier than the middle centuries of the Iron Age, when their far-flung colonists made port all over the Mediterranean world. Already in the Middle Bronze Age, they were famous for their maritime and mercantile activities. Archaeology suggests their entire society geared itself toward the sea, in fact. In a brief look at the mountainous terrain around their cities, coated by thick cedar forest and impassable ravines, tells us why. 
just like other ancient seafaring people, from Cornwall to Norway, the sea was a highway. And much easier to traverse than the hinterlands. Uniquely placed at a crossroads between the vast empires of antiquity, the Phoenicians were the ultimate middlemen. As long as they paid homage to larger states such as Egypt and Assyria, left to their own devices, whilst benefiting from all the latest technological improvements from the wider world. whilst adding quite a few of their own and gradually growing rich over the centuries, for their customers were many. It's thought that it was they who first invented the keel, an integral part of ships to this day. Indeed, their cargo vessels perhaps born on the trade route taking timber down to Egypt, were not only massive but ingenious, able to send small forests of cedar trees or other cargo southwards along the coast. But why did they call themselves Phoenicians? Well, we don't know that they did. In fact, they probably didn't. It's a Greek word often associated with a unique purple dye produced along the Levantine coast in ancient times. A dye extracted from the Murex sea snail, which would later be associated with royalty, even down to our age today. Initially due to the monumental efforts required to produce it. By the 4th century BC, Greek writer Theopompus sings the praises of this dye, claiming it to be worth its weight in silver. It's clear from its adoption by royal elites that this was a highly prized resource and extremely expensive, cultivated from around 1500 BC onwards. Perhaps in part an explanation for the success of the Phoenicians. A single vat required the harvesting of tens of thousands of sea snails, living only in Phoenician waters. An alternate explanation is that the Phoenicians may have had reddish hair. Regardless of the origin of the name, by the first millennium BC, Greek-speaking peoples were calling this region, which today makes up most of Lebanon, as well as parts of Syria and northern Israel, Phoenicia, and the land's inhabitants, Phoenicians. However, as we have seen, the Phoenicians had been around long before their interactions with the Greeks. They were the descendants of the Canaanite peoples of the Bronze Age, and spoke a version of that same language as well as practicing nearly the same religion as these ancestors. Now we must turn to their homeland. Today, Lebanon is a picturesque mountain nation, unfortunately mired in recent years by civil war and sectarian violence pulled into the struggles of neighbouring powers. It has a long history of this, for much of its past making up a province of a larger empire. The evidence of that history can still be seen near everywhere you look. The largest Roman temple found anywhere in the world, in fact, stands here at Baalbek. Once an oracle and pilgrimage site dedicated to the god Jupiter. The sheer scale of the remains here have baffled researchers for centuries 
with their immense size. Yet, underneath the surface here, and at nearly every major city along this coastline, the foundations are much older. Remnants of a time before the Romans, when this region dictated its own fate. When this land was known by a different name, famous in the Bible and other contemporary records as Canaan. Hundreds of Canaanite towns and cities have been found all over the Levant. And it is from Canaan that the Phoenicians sprung. And like Canaan, Phoenicia itself was never a unified kingdom, but a federation of relatively independent city-states, each with its own ruler. The most famous of whom, like Hiram and Pygmalion of Tyre, or Ahiram of Byblos, survive in history with mere shreds of evidence for their existence. For most, however, we have but a name. Or, in the case of the important city-state of Sidon, for the most part, nothing at all. Like the later Greek city-states, they shared a common religion, language and customs, worshipping gods such as Baal and Reshef. According to some, gods they made human sacrifices to. But they went their own way politically. By at least 3000 BC, the prominent Phoenician cities of Byblos, Tyre, Sidon, Beirut and Awad had not only been firmly established, but were prosperous maritime trading hubs. Their location at the nexus of many age-old Eastern Mediterranean trade routes linking Asia, North Africa and Europe attracted many different peoples from all over the known world. Though several mid-Bronze Age empires coveted the area, it would be the Egyptians who would have the longest and most lasting influence on Phoenicia. Between the 16th to the 13th centuries BC, the pharaohs of Egypt's new kingdom reigned nearly uncontested in most of Canaan, including the area that would later become known as Phoenicia. However, things drastically changed in the 12th century BC. When groups of migrants and marauders, collectively known as the Sea Peoples, showed up along the shores of the empires and kingdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean. No one knows exactly what happened, or why they had left their homes. But one thing is clear, the world after their arrival would never be the same. I actually just made a two and a half hour effort to find out who the Sea Peoples were, which you can watch here. According to Egyptian, Ugaritic, Cypriot and other textual sources, the Sea Peoples ravaged the Levant and contributed to what historians today call the Late Bronze Age Collapse of the 12th century BC. These often violent series of events brought about the total destruction of what was once the Hittite Empire in Anatolia, as well as bringing an end to Egyptian domination in Canaan. Finally, after the dust had settled, several new kingdoms and states formed in the power vacuum that was created all throughout the Levant. 
including the Phoenician city-states, now completely independent of Egyptian rule. Interestingly, unlike many of their neighbours, the Phoenician city-states were left relatively unscathed by the Sea People's attacks. Leaving scholars to suggest that the Sea Peoples may have colluded with or simply paid off the invaders. Regardless, the survival of cities such as Byblos and Tyre, along with the absence of Egyptian authority, now allowed the Phoenician city-states to end up dominating the region economically. One of the few Bronze Age powers to survive in a new age of iron. Testament to the adaptability of these city-states. Internal changes were happening too. Though its exact origins remain shrouded in mystery, in the years between 1200 and 1000 BC, Phoenician writing, likely an extension of earlier Canaanite writing systems, begins to show up in the archaeological record. Perhaps most important of all, at Byblos, five royal inscriptions dating to this time, notably including the Ahiram sarcophagus, show the existence of a 22-character alphabet, one of the first of its kind found anywhere in the world. A cutting-edge, democratising writing system compared to the elite-controlled cuneiform and hieroglyphics that came before. Another important structure from this time is the Temple of the Obelisks. Here we can see Egyptian hieroglyphics gradually give way to the Phoenician alphabet. A much easier system to learn, particularly for merchants wishing to keep records and contact trade partners. The use of this alphabet was then spread by Phoenician merchants throughout the maritime trade into parts of North Africa and Europe. Phoenician ports became trade hubs for all sorts of goods, the most famous of all being their region's prized cedar trees, great timber for building ships, particularly for Egypt which has almost no forests to speak of. This is a trade that would continue for thousands of years to come. Phoenician merchants also traded in manufactured goods crafted from stone, precious metals, wood, wool and even ivory from south of the Sahara. Such items were traded at numerous overseas destinations by seafaring Phoenician merchantmen, who in return brought back gold, silver, precious stones, spices and other valuable commodities. One might wonder just how such a small group of city-states with relatively few natural resources other than timber and a little farmland, could have been involved in the trade of such a large variety of goods. Well, one way was to act as the middlemen for trade between other states, their contacts being vast. Phoenician artisans were also known to take raw materials imported in other countries and turn them into beautiful finished goods that were prized all over the world. Yet this alone wouldn't have been enough to transform the Phoenicians into the great economic powerhouse that they became. The only way that they could reach their full potential was for themselves to expand into other areas. Areas possessing a variety of natural resources and goods to trade. 
natural resources no one else in the East had access to. The main problem for the Phoenician city-states was that they already lived in a crowded neighbourhood, and didn't themselves have the resources or the manpower to conduct large-scale military operations. If a Phoenician city-state wanted to expand its wealth or influence, then it would have to find other untapped sources of revenue. And so, naturally, they took to the seas. Over the span of just a few centuries, setting up trading colonies all over the Mediterranean world, in places as far away from their homeland as Sicily, Sardinia, southern Spain, and probably most famous of all, the ancient city of Carthage. Along the coast of northern Africa, in what is today Tunisia. Even in the later classical age, Greek and Roman writers still marvelled at the feats of Phoenician sailors, especially those from Tyre and Sidon. In the first century AD, for example, the Roman geographer Pliny the Elder says the following. Once, Tyre was an island separated from the mainland by a very deep sea channel, 700 yards wide. But now, joined to it by the works constructed by Alexander the Great when besieging the place, and formerly famous as the mother city from which sprang the cities of Leptis, Utica, and the great rival of Rome's empire in coveting world sovereignty, Carthage, and also Cadith, which she founded outside the confines of the world. But the entire renown of Tyre now consists in a shellfish and a purple dye. Though ancient writers believed that the Phoenician colonies may have been first founded in the 12th century BC, modern scholars tend to estimate a more recent date. Perhaps around 900 or 800 BC for most of them. Though no doubt smaller way stations existed before the establishment of permanent cities, most of these colonies ended up being temporary settlements. but others would eventually go on to become immense commercial and military powers, surpassing even the cities from which they came. Carthage. It's a name that rings out in history for centuries the focal point of the Mediterranean. Most successful by far of all the Phoenician cities, and according to many, founder of Europe's first empire. Yet, the story of Carthage is a tragic one almost always framed by its total defeat by Rome in the Punic Wars. Vicious world conflicts fought for dominion over the waterways of the Mediterranean. Massive sea battles numbering tens of thousands on each side. Numbers that arguably wouldn't be surpassed until modern naval warfare nearly 2,000 years later. For Carthage, a defeat so complete and brutal that this once mighty confederation was not only silenced forever, but its once verdant fields salted, its population killed or sold into slavery. The city would rise again but never as an independent power, peopled now by a different culture. Today, the city and the vast empire it once held lives on only in archaeology and the writings of its enemies.
500 years before the first confrontation between the two maritime powers. When Rome was still a tiny village on the Palatine Hill, Phoenician traders sailed their ships the length and breadth of the Mediterranean in search of goods to be sold or traded for a handsome profit. Of course, there were great risks in making such a long sea voyage, but the enormous profit that could be made made the risks worthwhile. The key was to trade a product that was unique, very desirable, hard to get or desperately needed, for other products that were common in the land of the people with whom you were trading. These products may be rare and desirable somewhere else, and the trader now had something with which he could once again make a profit. Though no doubt some plied the sea roads during the Bronze Age, by the beginning of the Iron Age, ship technology was at a level that the entire sea could be traversed in a matter of weeks. Before this time, ancient sailors didn't usually sail out of the sight of land, or at night, but these concerns meant little to the Phoenicians. Using the stars, landmarks, and eventually nautical instruments, they navigated the sea, making port all along its shores, ultimately leaving their mark on the disparate peoples they came upon. Far from an isolating experience, by the 800s, every 30 miles or so a colony seems to have sprung up. Way stations for ambitious merchants to make their fortune. Many cities we know today had their roots with the Phoenicians. Notably Cadiz in Spain was a large, well-established mercantile centre. It's even thought these newcomers began to influence the various Celtic and Iberian peoples of the peninsula. On the islands of the sea, Sardinia, Corsica and Sicily, widespread colonisation took place, not just commercial activity. And in all likelihood, a shreds of evidence on Sardinia, such as the Nora Stone suggests, wars were fought between independent leaders and incoming merchant powers. Perhaps supported by swords for hire, as Carthage later was. Wars left almost completely unrecorded in any surviving histories. Though initially the colonisation of the Mediterranean may have been motivated by the prospect of commercial gain, today some scholars have argued that years of reduced rainfall and drought may have also been a factor. This environmental catastrophe would have resulted in plummeting crop yields for Phoenicia's ever-expanding population. With little territory of their own outside of their cities, the Phoenicians' only option may have been to take to the seas in search of a better life. Resulting in a permanent Phoenician population in the Mediterranean. Due to its proximity to their homeland, the first area believed to have been colonised by Phoenician traders, perhaps as early as the 11th century BC, was the nearby island of Cyprus. A land replete with valuable minerals and metals such as copper. The largest Phoenician community here was based at Kition, which began as a small trading outpost but eventually grew into a prosperous, cosmopolitan city that after some time even contained a large Greek population. 
Evidence of other Phoenician settlements has been found on the nearby islands of Rhodes, Thera, Crete, Thassos and Milos. Along with those of the Aegean, the Phoenicians established a sizeable presence in what is today Italy. Before long though, they had to compete here with Greek colonists. For example, in Sicily, the historian Thucydides states that Phoenician colonists had originally established themselves all over the island to conduct trade with its native inhabitants. The arrival of Greek colonists, however, forced them to abandon most of these settlements and to constrain their activities to the northwest, notably at Motia, Solunto, and Palermo. This was also a much safer area for them due to its proximity to the Phoenician settlements in North Africa. Archaeological findings at Motia have confirmed Thucydides' account of a Phoenician settlement there shortly after the establishment of early Greek colonies such as Naxos and Syracuse in the early 730s BC. As we have seen though, the furthest Phoenician colonies were in what is today Spain and just possibly further to the north in what is now France and Britain though evidence of these is yet to be found. Here, the Phoenicians conducted trade with the locals, offering items such as glass, oil and ceramics in return for silver and tin. But this wasn't the only place Phoenician explorers visited. At least one inscription talks of a voyage south from the Pillars of Hercules. In the 5th or 6th centuries BC, under a merchant captain named Hanno the Navigator. Going all the way down the coast of Africa to the south of the Sahara. They even apparently made landfall before returning. Indeed, it is in Africa the most visible remnants of these people can be seen. The most famous and powerful of all Phoenician colonies being situated along the north coast. Here, the two most prominent were Utica, founded by colonists from Sidon, and of course, Carthage. In myth, founded by the legendary Queen Dido following the Trojan War, in reality thought to have been colonised from Tyre. Due to good farmland and perhaps fewer native inhabitants, these colonies overall prospered earlier than many of their peers, which may have motivated their inhabitants to create more permanent settlements and cities rather than temporary trading posts. In time, many of these cities would become the nucleus for larger states, and eventually, at least in the case of Carthage, the establishment of new colonies of its own. Ultimately leading to an empire that not only rivalled Rome for supremacy in the Mediterranean, but ultimately taught Rome much about war, empire and society. The Romans essentially absorbing the Carthaginian state along with much of its infrastructure, commercial ties and military strategies. During the latter part of the 20th century, the discovery and excavation of such settlements and colonies has greatly aided our understanding of Phoenician life and material culture. Though many Phoenician inscriptions have been uncovered throughout the Mediterranean world and the Near East, especially stone tablets, sarcophagi and ornate metal utensils. Other than the names of kings or dedications to various deities, 
few contain any significant details in regards to history. While there are several references in Greek and Roman sources to the works of Phoenician authors, perhaps most notably the early Christian bishop Eusebius, who talks of a whole range of Phoenician books, unfortunately, copies of these works have yet to be uncovered. In order to have been preserved, they would have needed to have been copied from the leather or papyrus they were written on at some point in the past. This copying by Roman or medieval researchers is what saved the ancient Greek writings from oblivion. Phoenicians, however, largely disappearing as a cultural group, had no spiritual successors and no such luck. In 332 BC, after spilling over the borders of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, last of the great Near Eastern empires of the ancient world, a massive army arrived in Phoenicia. After centuries of commercial competition, out on the wide open sea, the Greeks had come to the Phoenician homeland. For this was the invasion force of Alexander the Great, king of the far-off mountain kingdom of Macedon. Byblos and Sidon soon submitted, and according to Alexander's chronicler, Arian, he'd wanted to take the city of Tyre peacefully too. Seeking to make a symbolic sacrifice at the city's temples, Phoenicia never had a single capital, but Tyre, jewel of the coast, came closest. Ringed by immense sea and land walls, home to 30,000 people at its height. Proudly defiant and knowing the effects such a concession would have on their authority, the priests of the city resolutely refused the young Macedonian king. Alexander ordered a siege, one of the most hard fought of the entire war. Seven months later, during which time a massive causeway had been built from the mainland to the heart of the city, situated on an island, Alexander's troops finally got in killing thousands of its inhabitants. In total, according to the Greek sources, 30,000 of the surviving Tyrians and some unfortunate Carthaginians were sold into slavery. After which, instead of honoring the Phoenician gods, Alexander made a sacrifice to Hercules holding a procession in his honour. Some citizens of Tyre had fled to Carthage during the siege, which would survive as the last bastion of Phoenician culture for another century, until conquest by another Greek-influenced state, Rome. The rest of Phoenicia soon surrendered. By Alexander's time, much had changed since the Golden Age of Phoenicia between the years 1000 and 800 BC, talked of at inscriptions at Byblos and Tyre. But how and why did that Golden Age come to an end? Well, whilst the Greeks had few enemies to contend with in their homelands, besides other Greeks, often free to conduct their overseas activities with little stopping them. The Phoenicians had to deal with vast empires on their doorstep. Empires which collapsed in the Bronze Age, allowing the Phoenicians to flourish. But soon, those old empires would re-emerge, 
with the new Age of Iron. As we have seen, most of our post-Bronze Age sources on the Phoenicians come from the texts of others. The earliest being those of the Assyrians. Inscriptions of the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser I, who ruled between 1114 and 1076 BC, claims to have visited the area around the Phoenician city of Arwad, bringing back with him to Assyria the region's prized cedar trees. Egyptian texts, as well as the Hebrew Bible, also mention Phoenician cedarwood being an item of great value. This, though, was just the beginning. Around 870 BC, the Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II also mentions several military campaigns in the area. And by the reign of his son, Shalmaneser III, the Assyrian presence in Phoenicia had become more or less permanent. Though there were frequent rebellions, for example, several cities such as Byblos and Arwad formed anti-Assyrian coalitions with their non-Phoenician neighbours. Things in Phoenicia cooled after Shalmaneser's death, mostly due to internal problems within the Assyrian Empire itself. However, new Assyrian incursions into the region came with the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III in the 740s BC. And by the reign of Sennacherib four decades later, fear had compelled most of the Phoenician kings to submit to Assyrian rule. By then, Assyria was clearly calling the shots in the eastern Mediterranean. eventually extending its control over the island of Cyprus too. However, foreign domination of the region didn't necessarily mean that local rulers couldn't personally benefit from the new political order. Becoming an ally or vassal of Assyria offered rulers and their kingdoms various protections against their local rivals. For example, during the reign of Sennacherib's successor, Asarhaddon, the Phoenician city of Tyre became a vassal of Assyria. Its king, Baal, was able to swear unquestioned loyalty to Asarhaddon, and of course, provide tribute and military aid. In this case, the use of Tyre's navy were never called upon. In return though, Baal was given extensive control over several other port cities, including Byblos, Akko and Dor. This unquestionably made him the most powerful Phoenician ruler of his time. A client king of the Assyrians, like Herod with the Romans perhaps. Despite this, Baal eventually did revolt against Esarhaddon. Though Tyre was forced to resubmit to Assyrian rule shortly afterward. Another king, Abdi Milkuti of Sidon, rose up against Assyrian rule during this period of civil war, allying with another prince named Sandawari, the king of Kundi and Sisu. Although the two were ultimately defeated, and after attempting to flee into the sea, were, according to the Assyrians, plucked out of the waters by Esarhaddon, decapitated and paraded through the streets of Nineveh. When the Assyrian Empire finally fell by around 615 BC, many of the kingdoms of the Levant, including those of Phoenicia, were able to rule themselves independently for a time, until the rise of the next empire. one which inherited much of the infrastructure left behind by Assyria, that of the Neo-Babylonians, which in 585 BC, under the king Nebuchadnezzar, easily began conquering much of the region. 
with the exception of Tyre, which held out for over a decade until it too was finally forced to submit, though on relatively favourable terms. By around 540 BC, the final vast Near Eastern Empire of the ancient world, that of the Persian Achaemenids under Cyrus the Great, acquired Phoenicia as one of its many possessions. For the most part, the Persians allowed the Phoenicians to run their own day-to-day -day affairs as they wished, as long as they paid their taxes and allowed the Persian forces to make use of their extensive navies, which they did on several occasions, including during their massive invasion of Greece in 480 BC. The exception to this was during the reign of Cyrus's son, Cambyses II. According to Herodotus, Cambyses wanted to launch a campaign against the Carthaginians. But the Phoenicians, especially the sailors from Tyre, refused. Due mostly to the fact that their ancestors had been amongst the founders of Carthage, and links between the two cities remained strong. It's also during the years of Persian rule, as well as afterward, that many Greek writers and historians took an especially keen interest in the Phoenicians. Though Homer mentions them in the Iliad, Herodotus is the first major writer to extensively comment on them and give substantial details about their culture and customs also crediting them for introducing the alphabetic script to the Greek-speaking world. In his monumental work, The Histories, he writes the following. So these Phoenicians, including the Gephraeans, came with Cadmos and settled this land. And they transmitted much lore to the Hellenes, and in particular taught them the alphabet, which I believe the Hellenes did not have previously, but which was originally used by all Phoenicians. With the passage of time, both the sound and the shape of the letters changed, because at this time it was mostly Ionians who lived around the Phoenicians. They were the ones who were first instructed in the use of the alphabet by them. And after making a few changes to the form of the letters, they put them to good use. But when they spoke of them, they called them Phoenician letters, which was only right, since these letters had been introduced to Hellas by Phoenicians. In reality, the Phoenicians may not have actually invented the alphabet, which scholars now believe may have been developed by other Canaanite peoples in Egypt or the Levant, sometime during the Middle or Late Bronze Age. There also being a related script from South Arabia, probably born through mercantile connections. However, it seems that the Phoenicians were among the first peoples to both utilise and spread the use of alphabetic writing throughout the Mediterranean and beyond. In 343 BC, the cities of Tyre and Arwad revolted against the Persian king Artaxerxes III. But this rebellion was soon crushed. Other than this though, Phoenicia remained relatively calm and stable during its nearly two centuries of Persian rule. Until, in 332, Alexander of Macedon came to the Levant. Alexander's arrival and subsequent conquest of Phoenicia marked the beginning of the gradual Hellenization of the region. After his death in 323, Phoenicia was hotly contested amongst his successors, but eventually the region found itself within the confines of the Greek Seleucid Empire ruled by one of Alexander's generals. Gradually, Greek language, culture, architecture and religion began to permeate every aspect of Phoenician life. The age of the Phoenicians was over. The Hellenistic age had begun. In neighbouring Judea, 
the culture of the Jews survived, albeit with a Hellenistic influence. In Phoenicia, however, it wasn't to be the case. Like Vikings in the early Middle Ages, the Phoenicians being victims of their own success, merging with the peoples they came into contact with. Their culture gradually disappearing. In some respects, however, all peoples of the Mediterranean Sea are Phoenicians. Despite the new world that was forming around them, one aspect of the Phoenicians that changed little was their mastery over the sea. Especially when it came to maritime commerce. Their ships continued to traverse the Mediterranean in order to find new and lucrative trade opportunities. And probably due to this, Phoenician cities remained extremely prosperous continuing until about 62 BC, when the Romans took over, and Phoenicia was incorporated into the Roman province of Syria. By this time, however, many of the characteristics that had once made the Phoenicians a distinct people had almost vanished, as did references to them in literature and records of the time. As we have seen, however, the legacy of the Phoenicians is still with us today. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more history content. Leave a comment below if you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.